Good evening. Welcome to the Center for Architecture. Uh, I'd like to start by asking if there's anyone here other than Howard who's here for the first time. Name from Shack. Yeah, great. Well, especially delighted that there's so many students from the Shack Real Estate Institute here. That's just phenomenal, and thank you for taking the time and touring the exhibition with Michael. Um, um, I'm Rick Bell. I work here as executive director. It's uh, my privilege in Jill Lerner's absence. She sends her regrets as president of the chapter to introduce tonight's program. Um, you know, it's part of a speaker series that is very special for us because while it's in conjunction with the installation next door, the design in the heart of New York, which is presented, of course, by both the related companies and the Oxford property groups, um, you know, we talk about the center as a place for interdisciplinary dialogue, transsectorial, transdisciplinary discourse. And tonight's program really brings that home. And what Related and Oxford have been doing uh, since the exhibition, since the installation opened, has been bringing people to these tables, to these chairs who might not otherwise be here. And we're very, very grateful for that, as well as uh, some of you who have raised their hands who might not otherwise have known about this place. Um, this marks our 10th year. October 7th will be the anniversary of this excavation, if you will, or uh, creation of this place. But tonight, uh, Howard Elkis, uh, Kenneth Himmel, Mortimer Singer, and Peter Grant are here for a conversation on modern placemaking. I would um, reiterate the uh, thanks to NYU Shack and those who are here uh, uh, this evening for the program, uh, because we don't do enough together. And maybe this is the beginning of a more beautiful friendship. Um, after the talk, uh, there'll be a reception upstairs uh, in the breakthrough space. And um, I think what you'll see if you've seen the show already is something that changes each time we do one of these talks. Uh, and that's a kind of a special gallery, the Architects Gallery, where uh, changes take place right before each lecture based on who's speaking. So um, you'll see a little bit more of the work uh, uh, by Howard and his firm uh, tonight than you would have if you were here yesterday or even this morning. And that's pretty special that we could have that kind of uh, um, changeability to uh, highlight aspects of the work that then relate to the discussion that we'll be having here forthwith. Uh, we're now about halfway through that eight week program. And a uh, full line of architects, designers, and civic leaders involved in the Hudson Yard projects have uh, been here, and that will continue. Uh, I think the next program is on June 11th. It's called Parks, a Catalyst for Development on Manhattan's West Side, and that will have Matthew Johnson, uh, Peter Mullen, who some of you know from the High Line, uh, Lisa Switkin, and Matt Urbanski. Um, uh, for Michael Van Volkenberg, uh, Landscape Architects, and that'll be moderated by Holly Light who uh, has uh, had a number of very interesting positions, and I think some of you know her as executive director currently for New Yorkers for Parks. Uh, the final events in the series, mark your calendars if you uh, haven't already, will take place on June 19th and June 25th. Um, I'd also like to bring to your attention the next exhibition opening here at the Center for Architecture. It's kind of hard not to notice it. You walk through the construction site. We're doing the installation as we speak. Um, the opening is June 13th, and the show is uh, uh, Fit Nation. It's the culmination of, well, we're not over yet, but it marks the uh, eight years of interactive discussions with people in the public health community over what landscape architects, architects, urban designers, interior designers um, can do to help prevent chronic diseases, how our Fit City program relates to uh, getting uh, less sedentary lifestyle, more physical activity, walking more. Um, on stairs and otherwise. And that exhibition opening will um, uh, be more or less coincident with the uh, eighth in these series of annual all-day conferences co-sponsored with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene called Fit City. This one is Fit City 8 and takes place on June 24th all day long. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome this evening's moderator, Peter Grant. Um, Peter, um, as I think you all know, has worked for the Wall Street Journal for now more than 12 years and currently oversees uh, commercial real estate coverage for the paper. His responsibilities there include the property report section that runs every week, uh, also the monthly international property section, and the mon uh, Monday uh, commercial real estate page in the Greater New York section. In the past, he's also covered real estate for Crane's New York Business, The Daily News, and The New York Observer. And before Peter takes the microphone, just one last aside. As you leave here tonight, it was very special for us here at the Center for Architecture because 
a new space opened across the street called Adrian's Garden. And I just want to flag that maybe for Peter uh, for the paper um, because uh, after about five years of uh, uh, joint effort on the part of a community organization, Friends of LaGuardia Place and the city through Department of Transportation, Department of Parks, a new playground opened. There were a lot of kids there today. Absolutely spectacular. It's beautiful, designed by landscape architects Adrian Smith and others I won't mention. Um, Acom and EDA, well, I guess I should mention them. They did a lot of work to make it happen. Uh, and it's beautiful. Uh, so if you see a new playground that has a, a dragon in it and you're wondering how that came about, a lot of participation by the, the AIA and even more by the ASLA and a lot of community activism, civic participation, uh, things happen at a small scale. What we're here to hear about tonight, creative placemaking and Hudson Yards at a much, much larger scale that defies imagination. Um, Without further ado, Peter. Um, hello, everyone, and I uh, want to thank Related for inviting me to moderate this panel. Um, I'm probably one of the few people in this room who has a slight sense of what it's like uh, to work at Hudson Yards, just because I used to work at the Daily News, which uh, some of you might know was almost uh, just right on the edge of the site at uh, 450 West 33rd Street. And I can tell you from a lot of personal experience that uh, that's a pretty brutal walk in the winter from Penn Station. But uh, fortunately for Related, they're of course opening a subway there and Related also has sort of the placemaking dream team here to take a place which isn't very inviting and make it very inviting. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, who we, uh, the, the members of the team, uh, Ken Himmel, uh, as uh, is the CEO of um, Urban Related. Uh, he's also uh, been involved in uh, making some of the most uh, important and successful retail places in, uh, in the United States, Copley Place, Time Warner Center. There's a long list of others. You can see them upstairs. Um, Howard Elkis is the uh, co-founder of Elkis uh, Manfredi uh, Architects. Uh, he and uh, Ken have worked together for about 30 years, starting with uh, Copa Place in Boston. So uh, he, too, has a lot of experience in, in designing uh, retail places. And uh, Mortimer Singer is uh, the president of, um, sorry, is of Marvin Traub Associates. Uh, and he, as such, he uh, advises some of the top retailers uh, in the world uh, in picking some of the top retail locations in the world. And he's working with Related on also uh, turning uh, 750,000 square feet of retail uh, in what's now a bleak part of town into a very inviting part of town. So I, th I think we're going to start with a short presentation. And, uh, and then we're going to start asking questions, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity for people in the audience to uh, ask questions as well. Thanks very much. Good evening. Um, I, this is going to stay pretty informal. We've got a number of slides. We're going to try to go through these in about 15 or 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll get into a lot of questions. We're happy to answer a lot. We're going to cover a lot of turf tonight. Howard and I have actually worked together for almost 35 years, <clears throat> so obviously I was very, very young when we started. And uh, the truth is, we actually met in 1972 skiing together. And uh, five years later, um, I picked up the phone and called him in the Philippines and said, I have our first job we're going to do together. And that was Copley Place. So, uh, but we've, we've been on quite a run all these years. And I think you're going to see there's a common thread through a lot of what you're going to see. And it's been a learning process for us. I mean, I, I will tell you that. Uh, the project that we're working on here in New York will be the culmination of, of all those years worth of work and all the experience we've had. We both, uh, we all travel extensively. You'll see some work here even in the Middle East. But we're students of change. And that's the thing. You never stop learning. You never stop, abs stop absorbing what's going on. Because there's innovative things. People are doing exciting things. And you never stop watching for it. And we're, and we're trying to incorporate that in, uh, in the work that uh, you're going to see. It all starts back, um, back in the late 70s, early 80s. <clears throat> and uh, it started in a project called Copley Place. And ironically enough, for those of you who might remember what that looked like when I started, that was a, a turnpike interchange. And uh, sounds a little familiar. We built over rail, rail yards, MBAT, MBTA lines, Conrail, Amtrak. And uh, 
so as a result, um, we have some experience in building platforms. Um, I must say that as complicated as that was, it's not quite as complicated as what we're doing in New York. But the idea of, of trying to bring together neighborhoods and connect um, the Hancock Tower, Prudential Center, a turnpike interchange, and deal with all the rail lines is something we got pretty, pretty familiar with over those years. And all of it uh, was meant to, the, 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 the common thread that held it all together is retail. I mean, of all of my colleagues at the related companies, um, and everyone brings great specialty experience to the table. Um, so we have people who do great residential, office, hotel, but we're the guys in our group that really bring the components together from a retail point of view, which is the most exciting part of the project. Because think about it. When people enter office buildings, it's private. You go up to your offices. People enter their residential buildings. You go up and go to the residential parts of it. The only part of the project that people can truly experience, the full part of the project, is in fact the retail. And we've learned how to specialize in, in vertical. So, um, Howard, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about, we, we went from Copley Place in Boston. Um, this now covers Seattle, uh, Pacific Place. Both of these projects, by, by the way, are, are vertical retail. Um, in, in the case of Copley Place, we had, to build our, we had to build the first retail level at a height over the ramps of the turnpike. So we literally were 35, 40 feet above the street. And we were not in a very friendly part of the town in terms of connecting. Uh, but we connected back, of course, to Prudential Center. And then, Howard, talk a little bit about Pacific Place. Let me, if we can just go forward, I think we have a bigger picture of Copley. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's go to the next slide first. And let me just say that what we're really about is building cities. And as such, these projects, starting with Copley Place, are retail-driven mixed-use development. That's what we're talking about. So it's how all these uses fit together and how retail is really the fabric that not only holds all these together, but also connects to the rest of the city. So starting with Copley Place, we're really talking about urban design. If you don't plug in to the city that surrounds you, you will be isolated. You also will not affect the rest of the city. All of these projects we've been involved in over the years have really transformed that part of the city because they, they were pliable. They could extend, and they took the paths here from Copley Square. We had 30 feet to enter the largest mixed-use development in the mid-80s in the United States, three and a half million square feet. So we had a ceremonial entrance here, but there are many entrances to Copley Place, and it ties also into transportation. So we can go on, but uh, yeah. I don't want to dwell. So um, we, we continued our work together um, over the years, uh, a project that we did together in Chicago, um, the Peninsula Hotel on Michigan Avenue. For those of you who might be familiar with that, um, again, that street front retail on Michigan Avenue with a Peninsula Hotel that connected to it. Uh, by the way, the, the ability of a development and a developer to drive the connectivity in these projects depends on your ability to control the real estate. So that's the beauty of the related companies. I mean, our ability to be able to go into a mixed-use project and in-house drive each of the components means we can make retail and food and beverage and entertainment work in a way very few other developers could do it. And it shows up in the projects as you begin to see how all this come together. If you go to the next one for a minute, <clears throat> well, we're on to something else. But uh, I will say, back on Pacific Place, uh, the center space uh, in all of these projects, there's kind of a culmination, a heart. And that's what really pins down the whole development and gives it focus and basically a meeting place. It's the thing that connects to everything else. And in vertical retail, it's part of what makes it all come together. Uh, back on Pacific Place, uh, and now you look at the architecture here. The architecture always in our project relates to the city, to the space, to the, our context. It, we want to make it feel like it belongs. 
you hear about authenticity and so forth, were not a flying saucer that landed in the city. Just the corollary, it grows out of the city. So here in City Place in West Palm Beach, it's the architecture of the Palm Beaches. And that goes to something that Ken said about this project that is common denominator for all our projects. If we design it for the people that live here, then others will come. And that has been very much the case of, for example, this project. If you saw Seattle, you saw a huge skylight. It's surrounded by glass canopies. There's a weather component that differentiates Seattle. So we made a place that people could feel like they were outdoors indoors. So this is not a business for the timid or those that have very short-term views of the world. This project, and all of my associates, partners are here tonight that work with me on, the, on these projects. I mean, we are now um, in our 15th year of working on this project in West Palm Beach, Florida. And we are just after eight years, just got a convention hotel approved this past week. So we're, we've, we've seen to it that 72 acres in a place in Florida that really had no downtown has a real downtown now but it's taken us, we opened this project uh, almost 13 years ago, and it really won't be finished for another four or five years. So these, some of these projects really have long, long time frames. And public spaces, the amenities that go with these spaces, creating destination places out of the public spaces, and then orienting all of the, all of the retailing and programming around this is all part of this placemaking. This is the project in Chicago that I just referenced a bit ago. That's the Peninsula Hotel. Believe it or not, that project was built in two phases. The Michigan Avenue frontage, which covers Tiffany's all the way to Ralph Lauren, took on the character of Michigan Avenue. This was all done by Howard and myself and uh, our teams. And then we brought in three years later, we brought in a Peninsula Hotel. And we had planned for it in terms of our infrastructure. That is absolutely Chicago's finest hotel. Every year that hotel receives the number one award in Chicago. And it's a project that fits absolutely beautifully into the Michigan Avenue framework, great urban framework. That's another shot. In each of these stores, that's a Ralph Lauren flagship store. Tiffany's at the other, is at the other end of it. Great street scene as well. This is a project that we're doing together. We're on it right now. Morty Singer is, is, is involved in this with us and has been for the last three and a half, four years. This is a project that's happening in Abu Dhabi right now. And uh, we are opening in three months the first phase of the project, which is connected to a Four Seasons and a Rosewood Hotel and the Financial Center for that country. And then this becomes the second phase of the project. We're about 60 days from announcing two U U.S. department stores. One will be the second store in the Middle East, and the second department store will be the first ever outside the U.S. So we've been able to put together the team with Howard and Morty, U.S. talent, U.S. resources exported to a part of the world that's never seen a project like this executed the way we do it. And we've had enormous uh, receptivity to what we're doing here. It's a very exciting project which will have uh, another international hotel, uh, two towers connected with it as well. As an example, we're, we've designed a department store, and instead of looking at mechanical equipment on the top of the department store, that is all of the public space, gardens, and courtyards, and food and beverage, and, and uh, spa and health club facilities for a luxury hotel. So, and you come up from the department store right up to the rooftop, and you experience the hotel experience directly from the store. Now, finally, we're in New York. And uh, you're gonna, we'll take you through a quick run here. Uh, those of you who have had some exposure to Hudson Yards know the magnitude of the project. I mean, this is the largest privately developed, coordinated, single developer-driven mixed-use project in New York since Rockefeller Center. Unlike Rockefeller Center, uh, there is a, there's a significant retail heart to this project. It's vertical. It connects the two tallest office buildings. And unlike Rockefeller Center, we've made a point of bringing many, many architectural hands and talent into the project um, at the same time. We didn't want this to look like a project. We wanted this to be a part of New York. And New York is made up of so many beautiful buildings and great talent. It was an opportunity to bring some of the best talent in the world into the project. Uh, Cone Pedersen Fox is driving uh, the master plan and driving some of the major parts of this. And Howard and his firm are driving all of the retail with us. And uh, what we have, of course, is uh, we're on 30th to 33rd, 10th to the river, and the east half of the project represents almost 7 million square feet. Um, it's almost five acres of park, connects to the seven line, 
Um, the first office tower, that's the coach, um, L'Oreal and SAP. The second office tower, we're in a few months. I think we'll be able to announce the lead tenant for that. And the retail, which holds all of this together at the heart of this, on either five or seven levels, um, you'll see that coming up here in a minute, is what, uh, what connects it all and uh, integrates the project from a retail point of view. So this is probably a good one to, th for, for those of you who have followed this, this is the High Line that comes up and delivers you at the only point in the High Line that actually exits directly at the level of the plaza. So you are on the High Line, you don't have to change elevations. You move right into the public space for the project right here. This is the uh, Thiller, Scafidio, and Rockwell Culture Shed, culture facility, a major t off a residential tower they're, they're designing for us. This is the five acres of open park. The seven line is just to the north of this space. This is the so-called E Tower. That's the David Childs uh, Skidmore building, which is mixed use. And then this is the heart of the entire project. This kicks this project off in a very significant way. Now think about what's going on on the west side today. And you have to appreciate that someone in the midst of all of this massive 50 million square feet of development going on, on a, on a 10 block north-south access basis, someone has to develop deliver a retail, restaurant, entertainment heart to what's going on. There needs to be a real central placemaker in this. It can't just be scattered ground level banking and restaurants at the base of office buildings. And that's why we took the approach we took to this project, which was to create this, um, the model for this, which you've seen, which is the model that Howard and I have been doing for 30 years. <clears throat> it's New York City and it's a different time and it's a different time in our lives and thanks to Weber Hudson, who's my partner, who leads all of the retail leasing in this business, thank, thankfully we have the kinds of relationships today with retailers and restaurateurs where we have the kind of credibility we can bring these people to the west side in a project that very few people could do. And it's because of the excitement of the project that we get you there. So there's the, there's the heart of the public space in the project, coming from the seven line, and you're looking south, and you're looking directly into the heart of this Five Acre Park, that's the Skidmore David Childs Building, the major North Tower KPF building, and the entry to the office is here. That's the Culture Shed, and you'll see here in a moment that uh, it probably opens, no, oh, we didn't do that, sorry. <laughs> so that actually opens and closes, believe it or not. That's on rail lines, and that portion of the shed actually moves back and opens up. And uh, what you're looking now in between, the retail heart of the project is here on the left-hand side. And uh, what we've done is, is pull together, you know, incredibly beautiful architecture, unbelievably pro unbelievable program and planning and density and exciting uses. And the other part of this business for us is we don't speculate. So as we move through what we're going to show you today, we are working with real tenants and real users as we finish our architecture. Um, and part of the thing from an architectural point of view that creates, I think, a real challenge in why buildings all over the world today look like they weren't really designed for their uses is because people don't take enough time. Developers don't take enough time up front to go through the program and the program management so that you actually know what it is you're building. It takes a lot more work. You go through a lot more iterations. It's a lot more expensive, but when you finish the project, you've defined it so much more clearly, and it's so much more exciting, and it shows up in the architecture. <clears throat> so this is the, a section of all this which be, begins to show you how incredibly complicated this is. Um, we're over the, over the uh, rail lines, which consume 90% of the site. You can imagine trying to get all of the <clears throat> service and uh, parking and access into this and get people up into the project. Um, it takes a lot of experience to know how to do, deal with all that. But what we have is five levels of retail. You'll see that in a few minutes. And it could actually go to seven levels. We are in active discussions today with a user that would go to the top of the project and take almost 200,000 square feet. And uh, if that happens, we have seven levels. So it's somewhere between five and 750,000 feet of what we call gross leasable area. And the beauty of this is all of this connects the umbilical cords connect directly into the office building. So you've got almost 5 million square feet of office feeding into the retail and food and beverage. And uh, that's what really helps to make all of it work. So I'm going to let Howard pick up <clears throat> as we go through this. Why don't you talk a little bit about how this is organized and layered. So you can see this is a section cut east-west, west to our left here, 
and you get the sense, even though the shapes have changed, that there will be a major space on that major public park uh, on the west side, which will be virtually the heart. Uh, we've looked at many other schemes, but uh, actually what's happening on the ground is uh, we are connecting or setting up the connection potentially to 31st and 32nd. We're we're connecting at all the corners. So this block, which seems to be a, a huge mass of, of building, actually is very porous. There are many entrances for many users. And the circulation uh, all moves up from those entrances within the project. So uh, you could ask the question, how do you get all those people up and oriented and using all of those floor plates. As you can see uh, here, uh, this is the reduced scheme where we have four levels of serious retail and food is a very important anchor for all of these projects and becoming even more so and more creatively so. And so we have what we call the kitchens. It will be a unique kind of food hall uh, which you see on the fourth level, and then restauranting, which is actually on three levels, uh, so that we actually can have multi-level restaurants as well as single-level restaurants. And the idea, as you'll see, is that not only we'll be inside, but you will be able to push out onto terraces outside overlooking the city and the park. So where we can, it's indoor-outdoor again, breathing part of the environment. Uh, above that uh, are mechanical, and then other uses above, as Ken has uh, uh, indicated, uh, the uses on the upper strata of this project is still in flux. And that's very much what we deal with in crafting these projects. As Ken says, it's all about the tenancy. And that stays in flux as you talk to the tenants, and, but you have to have a grant strategy, and that has held constant. It's the armature. So, so one of the things we say about New York and New York architecture, the way these projects are done, is the best talent in this country, and, and a great deal of it is headquartered here in New York from an architectural point of view, design point of view, has done all of its most prolific and some of its best work all over the world, but have not had the chance to do it here in New York. So people, retailers that we meet with today, actually look at all this and they say, well, you've created an Asian model for New York. And uh, you know, I hope that's an affectionate description of what we're doing. But the, the answer is, a lot of what's gone on in Singapore, and Tokyo, and Hong Kong, and cities all over Asia, have been the use of these mixed-use projects. The developers are not afraid to go vertical with retail and restaurants. And developers in this country have been afraid of it because you really have to know how to do it. You've got to not only know how to do it, you've got to be able to convince the right users to go up in the project. Now you're going to see how we're going to bring people into this project and up into a five or seven level configuration, and you're not only going to like it, I mean, the best part of the whole experience is going to the top. And that's about programming and the design of the project and how you circulate and move people up through it. So you're going to see the plans on the left and some examples of projects outside the United States for the most part uh, that have been done that show you how you can move up into these projects in a very exciting way. But you have to have a retail mindset when you do this. You can't be an office developer and decide that you're going to give a token gesture to some retail. You've got to be committed to the retail part of this and the entertainment and the food and beverage part of it because it's way too complicated to make it work otherwise. And so here is the plaza level of the project. You've come up from 30th and 10th or 33rd and 10th. You've got to move up to one elevation that is the elevation that draws you to the plaza level of the project. That's where all the exciting landscaping and water features and all of our sculpture is going to occur. And the views out on the, on the left-hand side, the west. The lobbies of these offices, these massive office towers, is entries at grade in a traditional office environment, so we're not complicating their lives with retail. But when you move to the upper levels of the office, you're going to see in a minute, the connections begin. We go up in the project, the, the image on the right begins to give you some of the flavor for that dramatic public space, which is on the west view of our retail project. Even, you know, as you go into Time Warner Center today, 
and you look up, you've got four levels of retailing. It's got what we call the great room, but the, the magic of the project was the ability to visually and physically connect the levels going up and drive people up because of restaurants. <clears throat> Here, what we're going to find, many of the retailers of the first level will connect to the second level. So many of our merchants will be two levels, and they'll circulate within their stores, which gives us a whole anchoring on the second level of the project as we begin it. And then as you go up to the third level, we begin to introduce food and beverage, but we also will create a very special zone here, which will feature a kind of special destination merchandising for the project, which will be unique here in New York. It'll be put together with a series of great brands who will execute something very special, both architecturally and programmatically. And then, so we, we've really done, by the way, also here's where the first office building connects, the South Tower. So 1.7 million square feet of office space. That's uh, almost 10,000 people a day moving in and out of that building who can move into the project. The North Tower will do the same thing on one of the lower levels. <coughs> and then we move to the next level. And as a developer, we've, we've spent more time um, doing the kind of brain damage that you have to do to get restaurants to work in these projects more than any other developer, I think, in the world. And it's going to really come home for us in a very big way here because we've, I think we've really perfected the formula at this point. We've got it working. How do I know that? Because at Time Warner Center, on levels three and four, we have five restaurants that do pretty close to $80 million a year in volume. And the numbers are growing. They're getting better and better every year. So our ability to do what we're calling a taste of New York. So in this project, that what we're calling kitchens at Hudson Yards, I mean, think of Italy, but think of it with 15 different vendors, 15 different cuisines. And every one of the chefs who comes into the project will do something here in quick service, but high quality quick service. It's not a food court. We're not bringing in fast food. These are all going to be very high quality executions. Think of Thomas Keller at uh, Per Se and think of Bouchon. Bouchon is our retail and our casual um, execution. Those are the kinds of things that will be done here. And you're going to see Andrew Camerlini. You're going to see um, Eric Reipert. You're going to see Thomas Keller. You're going to see Daniel Ballou. You're going to see Danny Meyer. Think of the modern, but don't think of the modern restaurant. Think of the bar at the modern. Think of Gramercy Tavern and think of the bar at Gramercy. More casual, um, a little bit more informal, higher energy restaurants. Every restaurant tour, hand-selected architect. We're, we don't turn space over to people. We select the operator, select the architect with them, and we execute the entire concept. And that's the only way you get this composition to work in these projects. And it creates the most exciting experience for people, which is what gets you to go to the top. You can see something there at the blue at the top called observation deck. So we're on the fourth floor of the project. And instead of standing out line, in line at Rock Center to go to the observation or at the Empire State Building, we're going to bring you into this project year round. And on the fourth level, in our kitchens experience, we're going to have you queue and wait or go right into line. Three and a half million people a year, three to three and a half million people a year will go into this observation deck and move to the top of the project. Another anchor for the project. And then in our, in our scheme where we don't have a department store, this is the non-department store scheme, we anchor this at the top with an ex extremely interesting cinema concept, which is where theaters are going today. The more the theaters that appeal to a little bit older demographic, not so much just the kids, but people who want a reserved seat, want a business class seat as if you're on an airplane, um, much higher quality experience in terms of sound and finishes, and the experience of having all of these unbelievable restaurants available to you happens in this project. So it's, a, it's really six to eight screens, um, and it's a much higher level experience for people, and it goes beautifully with what we're trying to execute. And then on this level, we bring you to an entry to our private. We have a ballroom and pre-function and club and specialty restaurant going on at the top of the observation, above the observation. In New York today, the Rainbow Room doesn't exist. Sadly, Windows in the World doesn't exist. Today, there's no place in New York you can go for an incredible high-quality food and beverage experience with views. So the top of this tower is observation and food and beverage at the very top. And that, we expect, is going to draw an enormous audience. Now, understand, we have traveled. We travel the world constantly. We are using, as examples, our best practices that we're using are coming from only the best projects and executions we've seen all over the world. And we're talking to restaurateurs from Asia. We're talking to them from London. 
We're talking to a, a great collection here in New York, um, and we expect to, to really anchor this project with our food and beverage as much as anything else in the project. So I think that, that covers sort of the project side of it, and uh, we're happy to move into this. Thank you. So, um, Marty, since you didn't get to talk, I'm going to ask the first question of you. Um, you obviously talked to a lot of the top retailers in the world, and you've talked to a lot of them about this project. Um, when you talk to them, what are the challenges that they pose? What are the obstacles? Uh, what, are they, what are their concerns? And um, uh, maybe, Howard, you could sort of address uh, how you're getting over these concerns. So I, I think what's, what's interesting about this, and as retailers and brands become increasingly global brands, they're actually looking to this project and even uh, the Time Warner Center and saying, well, this is interesting enough what we're seeing all over the world. And finally, we're seeing it in New York City. And as I sit here looking at the future of the city, you know, I've spent the last few months going to a few retail conferences. and. Ad nauseam, they're talking about the importance of cities and the flight to quality, and that the brands and retailers want to be where the highest density of, and, and highest quality consumer actually is. And so, if you if you look at um, what these guys have been doing historically, but also going forward now, uh, this um, this this model, which is and Ken alluded to it, uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, being copied in Asia or uh, prolific in Asia right now, the top five cities in the world today by GDP are historically and today, three of those cities are um, American. And in 2025, they will be Asian, Tokyo, uh, Shanghai, and Beijing. New York will be the only uh, American city on that list then. So I think the, the globalization, what the brands want to see is ha having an experience. They want to be in a place which is exciting. They want to uh, see retail as theater, and I, and I like to talk about retail as theater because, in fact, that's why I'm sitting here, because I met uh, Ken and, and Howard through my late business partner, Marvin Traub, who was one of the inventors of that, of that, of that expression of how to uh, create a lifestyle experience. And when I say lifestyle, I don't mean lifestyle in the sense of the word of a, a lifestyle center. I mean lifestyle in the fashion sense of the word. Today, people don't want to, the consumer doesn't want to uh, be defined just by what he or she buys. It's, it's what the environment is that they are going to, to actually buy that product, what they're listening to on their iPhone or iPod while going there, and what brand of vodka they're going to drink when they arrive there after shopping or before. So it's about this whole experience. And where retail, as also Ken and Howard alluded to, is the hub to all the other spokes that fit into the mixed use uh, uh, component. I think that, um, in fact, the retailers are refreshed. And I would say also the luxury guys, uh, in particular, who are really used to this kind of environment uh, in, in, uh, in Hong Kong, in, in, in Tokyo, uh, now in London with Westfield, uh, the Westfield Mall there in, 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 uh, in, in London, as well as IFC in Hong Kong, they're, they, they're, they're incredibly encouraged by what they're seeing. OK, when you look forward to the future and you look at the uh, marketing plans for this, what percentage of the uh, shoppers uh, are going to be coming, are going to be local residents? Uh, what percent will be tourists, travelers, and what percent will be international? Well, first and foremost, uh, you know, I think Howard referenced it, our objectives always are to make sure that the primary audience that we really want to satisfy are people who live and work around us. Uh, there's no better calling card for a project than having people give us a reference they, they want you to go visit a project because they go there all the time. They're regulars. They become loyal customers. The reality of the breakdown of people who will use the project, we expect to be about 50% local and about 50% will be visitors, um, international and domestic visitors. Remember, we have Javits Convention Center next to us. I think over the years, next few years, you're going to see a momentum for a major convention hotel, which will be built near us. And so I think the split is going to be you know, 50% local. That'll be split into a lot of people who are nearby because they're office there, but then the end. We look at the whole west side. We look at this west side from a few blocks north of us, all south of us, as, as catchment area for us. And we know we're going to draw a number of people into the project. So could you talk a little bit more about the interna international visitors and the tourists that you're going to bring? Will the observation deck be a key part of that? Will it be the high line? 
you know i i think we look at the observation deck as sort of additional business it's not really the heart and soul of what's what's bringing people to the project it's the merchandising mix it's the tenants it's the restaurants it's the experience you know um the fascinating thing about time warner center which those of us who have lived through it and created it and now operate it understand is you can't believe how many people come into this project and spend time there <clears throat> they're there for the restaurants they're there for the retailing they're also there for the experience of being in the project and uh, also weather patterns and conditions it's hot here it's cold here it rains and when whenever you see any extreme weather conditions you see even more business coming into uh, our project and the seasonal part of it of course takes care of itself so um, I actually think it's going to be a pretty interesting dynamic, P pretty good mix. One comment about the High Line, I, I think the important thing about, about that is that the High Line doesn't just lead down to the south of the city from Hudson Yards, it also leads back to the history of New York City. And I think the brands really enjoy the fact that this isn't uh, a place that is just glass and steel, it has some history and heritage to it. And I think that connection of what the High Line has become, in plugging straight into this project, is an incredible catalyst for a consumer interest in, in what's going on. Howard, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how the d design has changed, if at all, because of the success of the High Line. Um, I mean, did the retail move at all? Did you change the entrances? Uh, well, the High Line is a force for the entire development. And so there is a great portal from the High Line, as Ken mentioned, at, at the same level into this amazing space. There are other places you can go from the High Line into what will be the entire Hudson Yard someday because it just doesn't stop at, at the South Portal, so to speak. But we've been very conscious of the High Line uh, in our planning of what's inside, not just what's outside. So uh, Ken talked about the restaurants as you move up. Uh, there are great views of the High Line. Uh, uh, the way Bill Pedersen has handled the coach tower, its atriums and so forth, this project really opens up to the High Line in many different facets. So I think that connection will be something that's felt as you approach from the south. Now, the other aspect is the serendipity of the High Line. Uh, it's, it's magic. You know, it has surprises. It, it just is an amazing place to everybody who goes there. It doesn't matter what the demographics are. And one of the things we've tried to do, and this has been a, an evolution, uh, is to create surprises, different kinds of spaces, experiences, and so forth. If this was monochromatic, layer after layer, it would be an utter bore. So the entire section that you saw and plan and the three-dimensionality has been really crafted over a period of time. And it also needs to connect to the spirit of the architecture. In other words, what happens inside this ought to look like it belongs in Hudson Yards, in the neighborhood of Hudson Yards. So you saw one little clue in the great space as you come in in the shard-like volume, which is layered retail. And uh, that kind of character now will play out as we develop uh, further. We've had many iterations, by the way. And at one point, I might say that as kind of a culmination of the High Line, in a way, uh, our original uh, uh, prototype for this building had basically a winter garden on top, something that in Time Warner Center plays out with uh, jazz at Lincoln Center. Uh, this was going to be a great space, restauranting, entertainment, and so forth. But it was always a difficult thing to program this. What really ha evolved was the, the energy and dynamic of the retail world just kept growing as Ken said, there's even a thought now of going seven levels. That was unheard of when we began. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the portals? Uh, where's going, what's going to be the grand entrance for the retail? Which way will it be facing, 10th Avenue or onto the plaza? So, so I think 
we would like to believe that over time meaning as this project is completed and open in the retailing is scheduled to open the fall of seventeen where all of the east rail yards will be finished the north tower the big office tower will be enclosed and be into tenant finish work by then but the whole experience when you arrive the seven line connections the the retailing the e building the uh, culture shed all of that will be finished in the fall of seventeen we hope that is the entry where many, many people will come and arrive. It's like the entry to Time Warner Center with Columbus Circle. I mean, that's really the, the, probably the best analogy. But we know that New Yorkers and people who know their way around are going to take the shortcut. And so we've got two wonderful shortcut drop-offs, which one at the corner of third, 30th and 10th, and the second one at 33rd and 10th, which is on the east part of the project. And so we have we've actually designed these incredible, incredibly beautiful portals that take you and you immediately move up by escalator and you're right onto the first level. And you've got the seven line. And the seven line has its own connection, which has weather protection, which takes you through under the north tower and directly into the retail. I understand the scale of, of the property just under these two towers and the retail. Time Warner Center occupied two city blocks of New York. Uh, the 59th is the portal and the heart two streets. We're really talking about three city blocks. So we need to have all of this porosity. And uh, it's been an interesting question trying to quantify the, the traffic, the foot traffic coming in from different parts. And uh, that's probably going to change because around this development are, is going to be greater amount of development in its aggregate. Uh, it'll be all around, but it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. The, it's an interesting thing that was done in New York, as you all know, is that these big blocks running east-west uh, were bifurcated by an incentive plan to build higher. And so that same spirit is what drives the way we have articulated the pedestrian flows through the project. Let's talk a little bit about why some downtown spaces uh, like this work and why some don't. Um, I hope there's no one from Brookfield here, but be because um, I'm going to, uh, World Financial Center, of course, tried to do a lot of the things that, that we're talking about here. They, it wanted to create a sense of place. It wanted to be attracted to retailers. But uh, retailing has always been challenged there, and they're completely changing the mix. What went wrong there, and perhaps you could contrast it to Time Warner Center. Uh, what went right there, and what did you do right there that they did wrong at uh, World Financial? Um, we actually had a, an opportunity. Is anybody here from Brookfield? <laughs> <laughs> we, actually Good. Had, we actually had an opportunity a few years ago. We were invited, actually, to take a look at it in terms of a complete repositioning of it. And I'll tell you what, you, you, you have to start with your the planning. It's not. Can't, you can't go, do a great design without a great plan. And a great plan works from a great program. And so it's all about, everybody who knows, who's working with us knows that we, we test and we retest and we design and we redesign programs so many times we drive all of these guys crazy, but they know why we do it. Uh, because to get it right, um, you never want to lose an opportunity. And, you, and you're, you're only as good as your last best opportunity. And so as you go and present these projects, you keep learning more about tenants and what they want. And certain tenants respond more aggressively. They want bigger spaces. They want two-level spaces. What happens when you're a pure office developer and you don't really treat retailing as the priority is literally you design these buildings from the top down. And what's left at the base is either one or two levels of retail space, but it's really office building retail space. Yeah, and I think to that point, I mean, it's very rare to find real, uh, real estate developers anywhere in the world who actually think like merchants. So from Ken to Weber and the whole team, it, they, they really sit down and they, they you think like you're at a, a Bloomingdale's merchandising meeting. They actually think about where everything should fit and how it connects and what's the flow of brands to each other from zone to zone. And I think it's easy to talk about that, but actually to understand and how to explain that to the brands themselves is, is, is an art, but it takes a long time to actually perfect it. 
when when you talk to retailers though um, are to what extent are they concerned about the fact that this is a, 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 a location that's at this point pretty far off the beaten path uh, it's not the corner of Central Park it's not Fifth Avenue um, how do you uh, assuage their concerns that uh, people are really going to show up. I think that um, if you look at the catchment of where Hudson Yards is, I mean, it, it is, yes, it feels maybe right now that it, that it is a little bit off the beaten track, but, you know, it's really not that far from one of the biggest tourist attractions in New York City, which is uh, Herald Square, for example. Uh, it is, has the, obviously the High Line, it has the Chelsea, it has the meatpacking below that, the catchment above it. I, I think that that's really not hard to show, particularly if, if the catchment itself of the immediate perimeter around it is probably one of the would be one of the largest cities in the country within New York City. So I don't think that's really been the issue. Every project that we showed you at the beginning of this, with the exception of Michigan Avenue, the only project that we have I would call a locational layup for us was Michigan Avenue, 730 North Michigan, because it was on the prime, you know, prime prime frontage on Michigan Avenue. Every other project whether it was Copley Place, or City Place in West Palm Beach, or Pacific Place. How about Time Warner Center? How many people do you think were there when Marvin and I made all those presentations with Howard to every one of these retailers in New York who looked at us like we had eight heads that they would never consider going to the west side of Columbus Circle? Look at what's there. They viewed it as an absolute you know, C-minus location for the kind of retailing that they wanted to do. And then we were going to take them vertical and not just put them on in a location, but we we're going to take them up on four levels and down to. So, you know, it's about placemaking. That's what this whole discussion is about tonight. It's about critical mass and placemaking and how you put the right program together the right way with the right design teams and the right tenants. And if you get enough critical mass, people will come to you, especially with what's being delivered around us. Well, what are your plans with regard to uh, cultural offerings, uh, the arts? That's a huge, I mean, that has been from day one part of the mandate in this project. So in addition to the, what, what's called the Culture Shed, which is a, is a democratic uh, program. In other words, if you were um, a great museum from Europe, or you were Bernard Arnault, or you were Eli Broad, and you wanted to allow the public to see priceless art, but you might wait 10 years to get a reservation to go to the Met, you can't get into Guggenheim, and so you really can't move your collection around. That's what this is meant to do. It's meant for not only the classic and the very deep and broad collections, but it's also for innovative and new. And it's both music and art and special events. So it's no, it'll be no uh, surprise to you, shouldn't be a surprise to you to hear something like Fashion Week will end up with its permanent home, in my judgment here, once we've opened the project. All of Fashion Week will end up at Hudson Yards, and because Javits is next door, there are so many ways we can incorporate culture and art, music, um, cultural events. Plus, um, our, my partner Stephen has made a commitment personally on, in this project to bring sculpture and world-class art to our public spaces like nothing, no one's ever made this commitment in New York's history before. Um, I mean, the list of six sculptors from all over the world, literally we are flying, I'm on my way to the Middle East on Sunday, I come back on Saturday and on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, we're with three of the world's greatest sculptors who we've been working with for a year who are competing for the right to put their works in our public space. And so it's, a, it's quite a show, and, it, and it'll be something spectacular for New York. Okay, thank you. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, okay. Um, well, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, and this question is sort of tied to the news that we've seen over the past week. Uh, we've seen 650 Madison Avenue uh, just go into contract for an exorbitant sum of money. We've seen the General Motors building, a big piece of that, also trade for uh, what's putting a multi-billion dollar uh, price tag on that property. All these deals are being uh, the, these, these values are being driven up because of the retail. And um, I can't for the life of me quite understand why that is. I mean, I understand that New York City retail is valuable, but why that valuable? Um, I mean, are merchants really able to generate that level of sales um, to pay the kind of rents that the landlords need to get to um, make their prices work? No. <laughs> 
But what they do is they, they allocate a big chunk of that rent and, uh, and put it into the marketing budget. So ultimately, as, as I've said, New York is and will remain through, at least through 2025, the, the most wealthy city by GDP in this, in, this, in this world. Therefore, having a beachhead in New York City, whether it be off Madison, off Fifth, on any of these amazing locations, now the Time Warner Center and then future Hudson Yards, you need to be here. And, uh, and, and that's the same with these other gateway cities, uh, mega cities, like London, Paris, Dubai, Hong Kong, Shanghai. That's why you're seeing those kinds of rents uh, in those cities as well. So part of the short answer is, <clears throat> I mean, Weber and I have, have built at least projects in Boston, Washington, uh, West Palm Beach, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle. I mean, we've done work in the, uh, most major cities. And at the end of the day, there's only one city in this entire country where a merchant can commit to a project in the hands of the right developer and have the right location and execute the right concept and believe they can do sales well over a thousand dollars a foot. As a matter of fact, on the ground level of our project, these merchants will do in excess of twenty-five hundred to three thousand a foot. Today at Time Warner Center, we have merchants doing five thousand dollars a foot and up. There's no place anywhere in this country anybody could do those kinds of sales. And sales translates back into occupancy costs, which translates back into rent. And usually these merchants can pay, they don't want to pay more than 8 to 10 percent, but in New York, they will pay 12 to 15 percent, in some cases higher, depending on the margins of their business. It all translates, that's what it comes back to, it's productivity. They, yes, it's true, certainly when you get into the rents going on on Fifth Avenue and Madison today, those are not economically justifiable, they have to be there. In our project, we're actually going to be able to justify what we're doing on rents because they'll be able to make money. I'm sure they'll be glad to hear that. Um, so uh, it's open up to qu uh, questions. I think there uh, you have a mic. So please have at it. Questions? Sure. Thank you. Uh, given that the city has turned outwards towards its water edge, I'm just wondering if there was any discussion about how the project might actually address the Hudson River Park, which is much more substantial than the High Line. And I feel a lot of 50 50 percent is going to be local and foreign or visitors. One of the weaknesses is that many people never make it to that park who are visiting. So it's, it's a connection. It, it, it's one of the real sort of tragedies in. Um, what you're beginning, what you're inheriting to begin with, because there's nothing we can do about the West Side Highway, <clears throat> and you know the the thought of continuing to start building bridges over that isn't something we support, and you can't go under it. Nobody wants to go through a tunnel. So the the problem really is you've got to you've got to take advantage of the moments where the connections to the park, uh, the Hudson River Park, uh, really work in terms of through streets. And if you think about what we started with, we've got a rail line that comes in at grade and a platform that has to be built that's like 35 feet above it. And we can't bring ourselves down to the street unless we could eliminate the rail lines. If we could have moved the rail lines or, or had them go to a different place, we would have had a whole different set of criteria to begin with. But it's a, it's a set of engineering criteria. There's really not a whole lot we can do about it. OK, one more, and uh, I think that'll be it. Sir. Yes. I gather that uh, Whole Foods and Hutchin Yards is not a marriage about to be made. Uh, not decided yet. Not decided yet. It's still open. We definitely have a market going into this project. Huts, our Hudson Yards project has a 40,000 square foot market at Street on 30th at the corner. And then it opens up just like Time Warner. It opens and brings you by escalator directly up into the retail. OK, one more question. Uh, my question is in regards to the type of tenants. Are you actually seeing a different type of trend towards the tenants wanting to actually own and condo their space versus renting uh, the space for a set? Are you talking time? office or retail? Office. Office, yes. Unbelievably competitive environment right now. I mean, all of a sudden, over you know five years worth of planning and great thinking on the part of the city, and the mayor deserves enormous credit for having had the foresight, the vision to have gone from a loss of the Olympics and the loss of the Jet Stadium to coming up with something that's far more exciting for the city. And, uh, but as a result of that, I mean, there's been a years and years worth of planning and uh, 
assembling land and getting ready to do a lot of projects, and now we're unleashing many projects. So our philosophy, which we've said publicly, and this is Stephen's philosophy from day one on this, was we're not, we don't consider ourselves primarily in the office development business. It's not our priority business. It is in this project because we want the manpower, we want people, we need action, and that office space delivers lots of traffic to us, which is great for the retail, hotel, and residential. As a result, we've taken a position with many of our tenants, we don't have to own the space, and so Coach actually owns its space. It was condominiumized. On the North Tower, which is 2.4 million square feet, we're in negotiations with seven different users, and at least half of them will also consider owning their space, which is a wonderful thing. I mean, you're about to find out that uh, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be an announcement soon on Time Warner. It's been in the newspapers. But uh, you'll see these companies who, who play their cards right. Owning space at Hudson Yards in our project today will prove to be one of the most valuable things a corporation could do 10 years later. They will make as much money on the value creation in that real estate as anything they're doing in their primary business. Well, thanks again, Ken, Howard, Morty. It's uh, been a pleasure and very informative.